And just like Forbes, another man, this time in Minnesota, was wrongfully convicted for a crime he didn't commit. And thanks to the good reporting by the Associated Press, new evidence was revealed. The state reviewed his case, and he was set free. Mayan Barrell was sentenced to life in prison in 2002 when he was just a teenager after being convicted of murdering an 11-year-old girl. The Minnesotan Pardons Board commuted his sentence to 20 years. He served 18 and will serve two years under supervision at home. Tuesday night, Burrell walked out of prison to a crowd of supporters, which is what you're seeing right now. Overwhelmed, Burrell's attorney made a statement on his behalf. Take a listen. Mayan Burrell wants to thank the governor and the attorney general for the action they took today. He is very happy to have the opportunity to go home to his family and start the next chapter of his life. He asks that you respect his privacy while he adjusts to life on the outside. He thanks the creator for shielding him through his journey and everyone who has supported him over the years. The Associated Press in February reported that his sentencing and his age at the time of the killing raised questions about the integrity of the criminal justice system and, uncover and uncovered flaws in the police's investigation. Joining us now is the woman who led that investigation, Associated Press reporter Robin McDowell. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. Now, the Associated Press, in partnership with APM, uncovered new evidence and serious flaws in this investigation. What was that new evidence that you all uncovered? Um, there were several things that, that came to light during the course of the investigation. One was the sheer number of jailhouse informants and their connections, um, two of whom recanted, one saying that his sentence was reduced from 16 years to three years, another who said he had agreed to um, co co collaborate with police on at least 14 other cases. We also discovered that during Mayan Burrell's interrogation, um, it, you could see on the videotape near the end of the, his interrogation that he told police he was not at the scene. He was at a corner store called Cup Foods, um, a store people are familiar with now because it is also where George Floyd was killed under the knee of an officer this summer. And he told them, just go pull the surveillance tapes. They never did that. Um, he also mentioned a few alibis while he was talking to police. They never pursued those alibis either. Um, there were fo jailhouse phone calls where the, his co-defendants were talking um, and saying to people outside that Mayan Burrell was not at the scene. This was just within hours or days of the shooting. Um, those were never revealed either. Um, I, it goes on and on. I think the, the trend that we saw and that the legal panel, um, national legal panel of experts also found was once police came up with their narrative, they stuck with it. And if there was evidence that showed that Mayan Burrell was perhaps not there, they ignored it. And if there was evidence that, that you know, made it look like he was perhaps not there, but per involved in gang activity or drug sales, they, they kind of clung to that, even though those conversations were really taken out of context. Um, so I could go on and on. <laughs> the, the legal panel put out a report that was 60 pages, and um, they did a very thorough, thorough job kind of saying or digging into many of the things that we found in our investigation. Now, I'm assuming that was you in the green um, that was hugging him <laughs> when he walked out of those doors. I'm correct, right? Yeah. That was me. Can you just tell me, uh, obviously, what did he say to you? Because, I mean, your reporting ultimately helped him be released from prison. Um, he just said thank you at that moment. I mean, one of the one of the things in Minnesota is it is it is not difficult to talk to people when they are incarcerated. And I was in close touch with his family, his sister, and especially his wife during that time. So. Um, you know, he, he's not a stranger to me, put it that way. And his fight is far from over. Can you tell us what's next for him? Yes, well, the pardon board commuted his sentence, um, but they did not go so far as to pardon him, which means that he still will be fighting in court in a post-conviction um, to try to get a full exoneration.
I mean, how does that work? The fact that you said he did this so they never reviewed the video store surveillance. Um, you uncovered all this evidence that basically showed he was not there at the time. He was at this store. He was with people. You said they used jailhouse informants. I mean, how does this still happen? How is he still fighting for his freedom after all this new evidence has been uncovered? I think he wants to know that as well. And and to be honest, um, many of these things were available or would have been available for the last 18 years. We didn't find a smoking gun. I mean, in this case, there was no gun found. There was no DNA. There were no fingerprints. Um, but the story is in the court documents. If you take the time to speak to the people that were involved in the case, the story emerges. And it's and, and I think one of the big problems with the criminal justice system, once you get to a certain stage, um, you have to find new evidence that proves your innocence. In Mayan Burrell's case, you have to look at the whole picture in order to understand how tunnel vision was was blinding the police and possibly the prosecutors if this was not intentional. And um, and and that's hard to get into a court because they're going to say, well, you know, it was it was known that these jailhouse informants were getting really generous deals or it was known that um, that these you know, these call these jailhouse phone calls were made available to the defense in, in this case. They were in the very early days given to the defense, but it was really an evidence dump. They gave them hundreds of, of phone calls and did not label them or tell them, you know, within days before his trial that what to look for or and they did and they certainly didn't provide him with the defense attorneys with anything except things that would make him look guilty. And one of those informants, um, if I'm not mistaken, was paid just to go along with the story for a conviction. Yes, this was another thing that we found, and it's something that, that hadn't been revealed, and I think the police did not realize they were giving it to us because he was not somebody who was on the evidence. He was not one of the witnesses that took the stand. Um, he was never mentioned again. He was pulled, he was pulled over um, after a shooting in a van, and the police brought him into the interrogation room. He happened to know um, the intended target of the shooting, that tragically killed Taisha Edwards. And he started asking them, what's the word on the street? Who do you think it is? Have you heard anything? By this point, they already had Mayan Burrell's names in their head. And he's kept saying, I don't know. I have no idea. I haven't heard anything. And they, and they said, you know, just tell us what you're hearing, even street chatter. And he, he said, you know, like, what if it's hearsay? I'm just hearing a couple names here and there. That's fine. Just tell us. We'll give you how much you're going to give us. $500 a name. So he ended up giving three names. Um, one of them was Mayan Burrell, whose name was out there already because of another jailhouse informant. And he was paid for that name exclusively. He gave two other names as well, and the, the officers did not pay for those. So it was clear that they were fishing um, for Mayan Burrell and trying to find anything that could, that could you know, stack up against him. And I mean, at this time, back in uh, the early 2000s, this sounded like it was a sexy case. Uh, Amy Klobuchar was the prosecutor at the time. Crime was high in that uh, particular neighborhood. It's a, an 11 year old innocent girl doing homework at her dining room table. She shot. I mean, has she declined to comment on this? I know she hasn't spoke on it, uh, and it and it helped her rise in the political world. <laughs> This was a highly emotional case. Um, I don't think anyone in Minneapolis can deny that. I mean, it was a little girl, Taisha Edwards, who was at home doing her homework at the dining room table. And it came at a time or followed a period of soaring homicide rates in Minneapolis, it, the, the time that many people have heard of that was called Murderapolis. So people were tired of gun violence. They were tired of drugs. They were tired of losing children. And Amy Klobuchar, as she came in to be the new prosecutor, promised them that she would find them justice and, and that she was going to be especially tough on youthful offenders. So um, the, the really rapid arrest and, uh, and conviction of Mayan Burrell and two other co-defendants was a win um, and one that was repeated again and again throughout her political career, most recently on the Democratic debate stage last fall. Um, after our story came out, 
she was questioned about this and really and forced to respond and she did she she's called for the independent but she called for the creation of the independent panel um, there was a lot of pressure from community activists um, and she she agreed to have the case reviewed which was you know a really big deal and especially given the amount of the amount of evidence that really points to his innocence that was I think that was a really courageous deal and another thing she did that I'm particularly happy about was calling for a conviction review unit and a sentencing review unit which could help future cases um, so after after the you know most recent findings by the legal panel she she said she was happy to hear them I, I believe she was supportive of um, of finding the truth, you know, she was. She said she is now saying and has been saying um, that what is important is protecting the innocent is as important as punishing the guilty. And um, Mayan Burrell's freedom definitely moves in that direction. But I think one of the things that I'm hearing most often from are regularly from people who are still incarcerated, especially people who were killed during. I mean, who were thrown in prison during that period is, what about me? I was a teenager as well. Um, sometimes, in some cases, the same snitch, the same jailhouse informants were used. Um, and sometimes it, sometimes it was the same police officer who was using shady tactics. Um, so I think Mayan Burrell, and I think he would agree with this as well, while it's, it's a tremendous victory and everyone is really, really happy to see him home, um, he is not alone. Yes. There are many other people. And that actually leads me to my last question, Robin. This was the first time in at least 22 years that the Minnesota, that Minnesota commuted a sentence in a murder case. That's according to the Department of Corrections. Do you think we'll see a closer review of similar cases like this in the future? I think we will. And I really hope that the media um, helps spur this along. The answers are there. The answers are on the streets. They are in the prison. People generally know, you know, if someone's guilty or innocent, but it's not just that. People were over-sentenced. Um, uh, in many cases, like Mayan Burrell, they were certified as adults without having a proper review, the review process. Um, there were many mistakes. I don't know how wide the gates are going to open um, because there's going to certainly be a reluctance to, to look at all those cases again. There are many of them. But I think the media, if they want to, can play a, a huge role in this. Robin, thank you so much from the Associated Press. It was a pleasure having you. Have a good evening and thank you for your good reporting. Thank you for having me.